the freight that travels through the country would find an exit point. So in a way, Calcutta can bring back its past glories as the main gateway uh, if this thing uh, should happen. And this stretch covers 40% of India's population and crosses many states. So tremendous po uh, possibility as well. And then, of course, Northeast India, right? Calcutta is a gateway as well. The Kaladan Multimodal Transit uh, Transport Project uh, that connects um, Myanmar uh, and to Northeast India, to Southeast Asia, is another point of possibility uh, for Kolkata. And I think uh, Prime Minister Modi has actually identified Kolkata as uh, an instrumental point, a staging area for his Act is, uh, India's Act East policy. And of course, there are possibilities uh, with China, the Kolkata Kunming Economic Corridor is another possibility, and this would bring back the old hinterlands of Bengal, Bangladesh, into um, uh, Calcutta's hinterland. So the point I'm making with all these possibilities is that port cities always look, or cities always look for possibilities of how it can connect with the hinterland. In Singapore's case, because it does not have a natural hinterland, it's a city state, it's a nation state, it positions itself as a global city state, so the world becomes its hinterland, or in some ways defined by uh, seven hour hinterland or what have you. Kolkata has a more natural hinterland and is just finding ways um, through technology, through advancement, through uh, communication, to enhance its connectivity to its hinterland. And its hinterland is now just not India, but um, India's neighborhood stretching to uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia as well. So um, Kolkata's port continues to thrive now um, because of uh, trade possibilities. And as India liberalizes, as, as India enhances its trade connectivity with the rest of the world, you can see Kolkata uh, becoming, uh, playing a more prominent role. And the figures which I have here shows that um, there are a great potential possibilities um, for uh, the ports to continue to do well here. And there are, of course, lots of trade um, with uh, Southeast Asia as well. Now, what about Kolkata and Singapore? What are the areas in which one could see possible collaboration? Now, here you can see that uh, Singapore uh, ranks second in um, the export that's coming out of the Kolkata seaport, sea um, and then also ranks fourth uh, in terms of uh, export destination. So uh, obviously there's a lot going on between these two cities and um, there are a lot more possibilities because um, there are markets, there are demand um, and the movements of goods and with sort of enhanced port facilities, um, better shipping, I think this area of growth uh, between the two cities. Now, the other one is, of course, technology. Uh, Singapore has ambitions and aspirations to be a, a smart city. And we are also seeing evidence of uh, West Bengal embracing that sort of ambition. Um, the West Bengal government has launched its uh, information technology and electronics policy recently um, to focus on uh, uh, AI, quantum computing, big data analytics. And these are going to be so important. And India and Calcutta has the natural talents uh, to, to do this sort of thing. Singapore's talent, talent pool is more limited. It has to um, in, attract talents from outside. But here, uh, there is an abundance in this country. And then there's the Bengal uh, Silicon Valley, the IT hub that's being built in a new town in Kolkata, a, a knowledge kind of a hub. And again, these are uh, very important possibilities. Here is where the two countries need not, in a way, be seen as competitors, but collaborators as well. And so if there are opportunities, and I'm sure um, G to G, the government to government, they must be talking about these possibilities uh, on how we could collaborate. Now, so in a way, um, uh, as a historian, I would like to always try to find relevance in history. Could this be, in a way, a return to history, where the two ports are uh, the, the two cities uh, come back together again um, to develop each other. Um, there are many similarities in uh, both in, in, in West Bengal and in Singapore. The services sector, 
account for a huge part of its GDP. I mean, Singapore has no, I mean, manufacturing is important, but obviously it is not going to be the mainstay as it faces competition. We have no rural sector in Singapore, so the services is going to be key. So I think similarly in West Bengal, we see the service, the size of the service sector, the tertiary sector. So these are common areas where we can try to commemorate. And Singapore is actually interested in investing um, in uh, the hinterland in West Bengal, you know, the airports, um, Changi International has invested in the, the uh, Aero, Aerotropolis, um, the India's first privately managed airport city. And then, of course, the Singapore uh, so Sovereign Fund has invested in uh, Kolkata Riverside Development, a township. And then uh, uh, Sabana Jurong, which is also a, a, a partially owned government company, has invested in the growth axis, the master plan, and so on and so forth, and the metro. So these are all possibilities. Um, of course, Singapore is being opportunistic here. This is, these are business opportunities, but if the investments could bring the two cities closer together and generate more people-to-people -people connection, I think it's going to be a positive uh, outcome for both cities. And of course, I mentioned smart cities, and here is where... Um, um, Director Raja Mohan is very keen to develop uh, more knowledge in Singapore of fintech and uh, blockchain technologies. Um, that must be developing very well in, in India and see whether uh, we can uh, learn from each other and draw technologies to benefit our ambitions in this regard. So I, I conclude because I think I, I, I didn't notice that time has passed so quickly. Uh, the whole idea of looking at India and Kolkata is to try to understand them as cities. Try to understand them as cities. And if one were to look historically, then they had evolved uh, as port cities under an empire. And their character was to a large extent framed by their roles as cities, but also by their relations with the hinterlands, which then affected what became of them subsequently. Now, port cities um, have a certain personality, right? They may, um, with time, change their functions. So, you know, traditional shipping, traditional cargo movement may no longer be the flavor of the day. But port cities have instincts, and those instincts basically suggest that they have to always be on the lookout for opportunities, be open to ideas, stay connected. Singapore tries to do that, and I'm sure now, as I've suggested earlier, Calcutta looks for those opportunities, opportunities as well. So while Calcutta may not be the best port or the most busiest, the busiest port in the world, but it could develop itself into hubs, into nodal points of other sort of activities. And when one looks at London, New York, you see they have how they've transformed from former port cities, traditional port cities, into financial centers, into legal centers, into administrative centers. And here are where cities, in my view, have the capacity to do so. I was just telling some students the other day that cities have been around for maybe five, 6,000 years. Nation states have been around only for two centuries. So which entity has a chance uh, for longevity? I think they are cities. And on that note, I'll end my lecture. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Tan, for that fascinating overview and the insights. Uh, Professor Tan would be happy to take questions. I think we can have we, have, we have, we have quite a bit of time, maybe 15, 20 minutes for questions. So the floor is open. Please identify yourself and uh, keep your questions brief and pointed. When uh, we think about connecting two cities, we need to connect uh, the to and fro, I mean the movement as well. But what we see from India, the movement to, to uh, each and every of the, those countries, either Singapore, Malaysia, or Laos, or Thailand, there is no connection by water. It's only, only the air connection. So what I feel that is also lagging behind the, the connectivity. You see, like the young people who like to travel to Singapore, to other people by, by the sea. You see, that will be, that will be much, more, uh, much more legible and also much more cheaper. That's what I believe. And also the, the ancient form of trade is that people used to take some things with them. You see other than uh, big ship loads are going on these days. But the, the travelers, they used to take something, some very uh, this thing, important, distinctive thing with them to another country, which used to be uh, 
uh, which is also a way of connectivity, you see. So the more, the more per, uh, people to people co uh, connection would be there, the more connectivity can develop. That's what I believe. Your take, sir. Uh, yes, I, I agree that, you know, this connectivity should not be limited to G to G, government to government, right, or business to business. I think people to people is very important. So the organic growth of connectivity, people to people, cultu cultural exchanges, for instance, um, diaspora, now these are all very critical. Um, on, on travel by ship, I, I'm not sure. Maybe now it's a form of tourism, right? You go on a cruise and you travel, sail around the region, maybe that's good. But for efficiency, I mean, air travel, is, you know, there, there's nothing like air travel. I mean, Singapore to Calcutta is all four hours by air, very fast. And you could do it in the morning, you come here, you know, and you can spend uh, half a day to do other things. So it's actually very efficient. And I think that's going to be more uh, popular with people. But I think there's nothing to stop people. They want to take a cruise, you know, and just bring things with them and, and sail to these different parts as tourists. I think that's happening too. And this, this part of the world, um, um, the, the, the seas around here, um, the Bay of Bengal, the Andaman, uh, Straits of Malacca, all, all these are points of uh, are these are areas of connectivity, and I think there there must be lots of opportunities. I'm going to try and keep this short. I'm a woman, Bengali and Indian, so it may not be short, but I will try to. <laughs> um, and I wear another hat. I'm Singaporean too. I've been living in Singapore for 17 years. My name is Riyashi Sen, and it's more of a commentary and a little bit of a take on what you just mentioned on cultural exchanges. Um, the interesting thing is, I think uh, one of the very strong parts of Bengal and Calcutta is the movie industry. And uh, some of the biggest and uh, most revered names have come from Calcutta. And Singapore in its own now, especially the Singapore Film Commission, is uh, looking at a shift in focus and um, looking at collaborations rather than made in Singapore to made with Singapore. And I and interestingly, the first ever Bengali International Film Festival was held in Singapore. So uh, I feel that's a very interesting area of collaboration and trade, especially because um, the media as itself and OTTs are ex uh, growing so much. And there's such a huge investment of, say, the Netflixes of the world to invest in Asia. No, I, I, I see that as, a, a, again, a tremendous opportunity. And I think the Institute of South Asian Studies is always looking out for opportunities to do this sort of things in collaboration um, with um, film houses or with any agencies that want to bring this. And you're absolutely right. There's a growing interest in that kind of um, cultural exchange, uh, movies, uh, filmmaking from India, uh, from China even. So I think we should explore this. What I would like to see from a personal point of view as a Singaporean is to have a more cosmopolitan Singapore that mustn't forget that there is Asia is our backyard, that we don't always look to America or to the West as you know, our destinations, but that Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Asia constitute our backyard. And we, the, the, the more we, we derive our cultural bearings from these places, the better it is for us, the richer it is for us. So that's my point of view. So I, I think that's very exciting and I hope to attend one of your sessions uh, in, a, in the near future. My name is Shundip Banerjee. Uh, I am film TV artist and media. Uh, my question is to you that uh, for develop the port functions manufacturing between India and Singapore uh, and to develop the port, uh, do you think that uh, for this reason uh, to develop the trade business and employment, India and Singapore, there should be an agreement held between the governments uh, for more um, and more new assignment uh, for development needs on money? I, I, I'm not a government official, so I really can't speak for the government. But I, I can say that, you know, in Singapore government always looks for opportunities. It always looks for opportunities. And, um, you know, my colleagues at the South Institute of South Asia Study will know that uh, we have this ongoing dialogue between S Singapore and India, strategic dialogue. And in the, in the strategic dialogue, we always identify areas where, you know, there are growth potential. So... Um, Developing development of new cities like Amrati. Um, the uh, Singapore company has provided the master plan and we hope that at some point in time we'll be involved in building uh, things in, in, in that city. Um, 
airports, you know, for the longest time, Singapore, Singapore Airlines, Singapore for Airport uh, authorities have been interested to help develop airports in Delhi, in Mumbai, in uh, Tamil Nadu. And I think there have been some successes, there have been some <coughs> failures. Delhi communications is, is another area where I think there, there could be a lot of uh, potential for collaboration. Port facilities, I think, is a very natural thing because although Singapore now has tried to diversify its economy, it still functions as probably the second most, second busiest port in the world today. So in terms of shipping tonnage, it, it's still very active and it's still developing its port facilities. Of course, it's, de it's leveraging on technology now, less so on people because of a shrinking population and shortage of talent, so it's using technology more. Um, but, you know, if there are opportunities in India, in Calcutta, elsewhere, I'm sure the Singapore government will be very interested to look at those possibilities. Thank you. Uh, I'm, going to try and I'm going to try and say this carefully. Uh, one um, stereotype of Calcutta is that we are very, very indisciplined. One stereotype of Singapore is that you're extremely disciplined, <laughs> to a fault almost. In fact, the question is that when you say that Singapore looks at itself as a global city, yeah. and you think, what does it take to be a global city? One factor that may be mitigating or acting against Singapore be being a successful global city is this over-discipline, because you when you think of London, New York, etc., you think of, the, in a sense, the creative chaos, the lack of discipline which, which spurs innovativeness, creativity. So how is Singapore managing this conflict if it is seen as a conflict? No, no, I, I, I think uh, you're absolutely right. In, in a sense, um, if, if one understands this as a form of historical evolution, Singapore emerged, as I said earlier, as a... Uh, nation state in 1965, very un un unexpected. It did not expect to be a nation state. In fact, it expected to remain as part of Malaysia or part of some larger federation. So it came as a shock to its entire system that it now had to function on its own as a sovereign nation state. So one of the things you had to do as a nation state is to build nationalism. But Singapore was the most unnatural nation. It did, it did not have an uh, indigenous population. It did not have a common language. It did not have a common religion. So on what do you build nationalism, right? So founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and his first cabinet basically said, let's worry about taking care of people first. And you build a state first. In other words, you build the economy, you build schools, you build housing, healthcare, to provide for the people. And on that basis, you hope to build some belonging. So it was a necessity at that time. The first two or three decades, you had to build those things first. And that required discipline. That required some form of conformity, toughness even. And that's why his government, uh, his approach has always been known as a no-nonsense approach. You, nobody owes you a living, he used to say. Nobody owes you a living. You have to work hard for that. And then you have to make a success of Singapore. And the odds again, Singapore succeeding in 1960 was very high. Most people have written this off. Arnold Toynbee, the famous historian, actually said in 1966, Singapore is a bit of a joke of a nation. It's not going to go very far because it's small. It had nothing, no natural resources, no hinterlands. So that was necessary. But is that going to be sufficient for Singapore to go forward? And that here is where I agree with you, that as a global city, its orientation has to change. So the trick, the challenge, is how do you maintain some form of unity and discipline and yet be able to live with some degree of messiness, right? Because the world is going to be complex. And how do you deal with that? And that is going to be evolutionary as well. There is always the fear, and that's why some people challenge me when I say this, that, oh, Singapore is paranoid, that is, is always worried that it will not survive. And, you know, whether you agree or not, nobody knows, because the fear is that when things break in Singapore, you're not going to put it back together again. It's just so fragile. So do you believe in the survivalist argument of the government or not? Some people think, oh, the government is just using that to frighten you, that Singapore will be fine. Nobody knows. So the thing is, how do you calibrate that space between needing to make sure that things work, things work well, but at the same time, live with a bit of sort of edginess? And so here I'm going gonna, gonna to pitch my college to you because the, f the, the, fr the, the, the establishment of a liberal arts college in Singapore uh, represents an acceptance that perhaps 
things have to change. Things have to change. Now, whether that change can be managed, nobody knows. But I think as Singapore matures as a society, as a country, you're going to have it like it or not. You know, um, I used to say that Lee Kuan Yew could control what people read or see because you have censorship, right? You, you control the newspapers, you control the TV. Now with social media, what can you control? You, what can you control? And you know, even the, the Great Wall, you know, the firewall that China built, you know, there are all sorts of leakage, leak, uh, leakages and you have to deal with it. Singapore is an open city. It has to remain open. You know, if you build a firewall in Singapore, no investor will come to Singapore and that will be the death of Singapore. So you have to open up the space. But how do you open up the space while at the same time maintaining a certain acceptance that Singapore is different? That if we have a communal riot in Singapore, that will frighten away all investors and that would be the end of Singapore. If the Malays and the Chinese were to fight, the Indians and the Malays were to fight, what would happen to Singapore? So, so, so that's the thing that you have to learn how to negotiate. So multiculturalism works, but is multiculturalism, real multiculturalism? I, I just published a, a, a piece in the Straits Times today about, you know, Singapore has this uh, racial... Uh, uh, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Singapore has this racial categorization called the CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others. And the, the population is categorized along those four races. Um, now people are saying that the CMIO is too rigid, that the Singapore identity is more complex now. Intermarriages, hybridity. So those things are being pushed. Meritocracy, which used to be the cardinal organizing ideology of the ruling party. In other words, nobody should... Um, Nobody's future should be determined by your race, who you come, where you come from, how rich your parents are, but by the merit of what you are able to bring to the table. Meritocracy, it's a wonderful ideology. It worked in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but now with rising inequality in a rich society where some people can afford support in the school system and others cannot, does meritocracy still work? So what I'm saying is that Singapore is evolving and it's changing and it's realising that many of the assumptions that it made earlier may not hold true, including very tough, top-down discipline. So maybe the time has come for some...